So, hi. Um, it's a lot of first times for me today. It's my first AmberConf. It's my first time speaking at an um, international conference. And it's also my first time here on the West Coast. So, yay. Uh, <laughs> Um, so my name is Drew. Um, you can find me on Twitter as Arkham with a four. Um, as you probably can tell, I'm Italian. It's... Whoa, whoa, whoa! Um, <laughs> I knew someone wouldn't believe me, so I'll just say something in Italian, which is "Mamma butta la pasta," which is what you say to your mom when you're hungry and you want her to cook pasta. Um, so two years ago, I moved to London, UK, and I still live there. So I guess I like it. There's no sun, but I've brought you a picture of our lovely queen, just as a token of friendship. Um, I'm working in a company called Alpha Sites, and uh, the engineering team has offices both in London and New York. We're huge Rails and Amber fans, so come talk to me if you want to know more about that. Um, a year ago, I started um, rock climbing, and this is me on the middle of a wall. <laughs> Actually, I learned yesterday there are so many rock climbers here, and I think the plan is to go tomorrow after the end of the conference to a gym here in Portland. So if anybody wants to come, just let me know. I'll add you on Slack. So, yeah. Um, so now I think it's officially business time. Um, so I'm here to tell you guys about the story, and it's the story on how I learned Amber and how I learned to love Amber in the process. So, um, as all good stories, it actually starts um, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Actually, Italy. Um, and I was a PhD student working on this project on packeted field train in high-speed networks. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it is boring as it sounds. Um, I was hanging out with some friends of mine who had just started a Rails consulting company, and um, they asked me if I wanted to join. And yeah, since I didn't really like academia that much, I was like, oh, well, sure, sounds fun, why not? Um, <clears throat> well, little did I know that um, actually I didn't really know anything about web de development. So uh, I had like a sort of formal CS training, but actually like, didn't really know what HTML was or JavaScript. I still don't think I know what CSS is, so yeah, there's that. Um, I started learning this language, uh, which is called Ruby. Um, it's my favorite language. It's always been. So I've always been a Rubyist at heart. But apparently, you can't really build websites using Ruby. You have to learn a framework. So the, fr the first framework I learned was Ruby on Rails. Um, and I really liked it. And I think that's like something which is extremely common like, between uh, back-end developers to learn Ruby and then learn Rails. And then, after you learn Rails, you learn about um, object-oriented patterns, and then you learn about testing, and I think after that you get to a place which is mostly happy. So, <laughs> you, you, you're in this kind of paradise of the back-end developer where you do what every back-end developer loves to do, which is writing clean code, testing your code, writing stuff which just like feels good. And, um, so, yeah, I was working in this uh, consulting company. I was pretty happy with myself. But then one day came the JavaScript. Dun, dun, dun. <clears throat> so, uh, as a consulting company, you um, have to do pretty much everything. So, as soon as you have to build something which is a bit fancier, something a bit more interactive, you have to use JavaScript. So, I started learning this library, which was called jQuery. And I really liked it. And then over the next two years after that, I went through a fair number of JavaScript frameworks. So I've just like written down a couple of them now, which are Knockout, Backbone.js, Marinette.js, Batman.js. I think it's that now. Um, Angular.js. And even though I learned so many different types of JavaScript frameworks, I really wasn't that happy. It was like nearly not as happy when it was uh, mm, writing JavaScript. So, um, why is that? I think I have to ask for help from Johnny Ive here. And it's something I like to call the Apple effect, which is if you tell uh, three times every year that you're going to revolutionize everything and you're going to change everything, 
it starts to get harder and harder to be um, reasonable. So yesterday, no, actually it was a couple of days ago, I went through the Apple website, and this is a couple of the things I found. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I really like um, the most powerful four-inch phone ever. <laughs> That's the new iPhone. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I completely made this up. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I think I was pretty deep in this pit of JavaScript disillusionment. So I kind of really believe that Anything can come out um, like in a nice way when I was, whenever I was writing JavaScript. But you know, like as a, as a sort of back-end developer, you sort of get inside your role. So I'm just writing back-end code. Like, OK, I know how to write a little bit of JavaScript, but even if I don't like it, and even if I don't do it, it's not the end of the world, because I have my Ruby, I have my object-oriented patterns, I have my tests, so everything is good, right? Um, well, I thought so. But one day, again, um, in the company I'm working for, we decided to rewrite a huge part of our Rails app into an Ember app. And at that time, I've never tried Ember before. So I was like, well, you know, I had already, like, a little bit of experience with JavaScript, so um, I wasn't really excited. I think something really close to my expression was this. Um, but then, I'm naturally curious, so I started poking around a little bit in the framework, started writing like some app, little apps, and you know, initially it's like, okay, this feels quite familiar. It has models, it has views, it has controllers. It just like feels like everything I already know. Um, well, 15 minutes later, after that, um, I think it was something like this. <laughs> You know, like, all the names were the same, but actually the, the whole thing was just something completely different. So my friends told me to leave this slide. They said it was the best of the talk, so I'm just going to linger it for a while. Um, okay, time to move on. So um, even though I thought I knew Rails and I thought I knew JavaScript, I didn't really know anything <laughs> in Ember. So... I think one of the biggest reasons why I wasn't a huge fan of Ember is because it does a lot of different things. And I think in the keynote, um, Tom and Yehuda spoke about the Unix philosophy, which I think is uh, one of the um, starting points for every web developer to be a Unix fan. And there's uh, this uh, very famous concept, which is KISS, which stands for keep it simple, stupid, um, in the Unix community, which is uh, basically the motto of Unix, which is also in the Zen of Python, because they say a simplex is, a simple is better than complicated. The complex, whoa. And they also say, uh, write programs that do one thing and do it well. Um, also one of my favorite artists put it quite well, I think. Um, so, <clears throat> this was pretty much two years ago, and now two years later, uh, I'm here. I actually really love Ember, and I think a couple of months ago, um, I was just like working on a new feature, and like, I just like caught myself saying, well, I think I can do this in Ember. I, I, I think I can do everything in Ember. So um, my goal for today, if just like, if, just, if it's just like one thing, is um, tell you like what made me change my mind. Um, I think over the years, as a Rails developer, you build a lot of apps and you value the simplicity of Rails. So you learn this way of programming, this way of writing code, this way of rendering a page, and you think that that is the solution of your like of programming in general. Um, but Google released this app, which is called Gmail. I'm sure you're familiar with it. So if you think as a Rails developer, and you think, well, tomorrow I have to rebuild Gmail. How do I do it? And if you think about like, the normal ways of writing code in Rails, in, there isn't really a good solution in it, because you're dealing with, this is actually my real emails, please don't 
take screenshots or something like that. Is it recorded? Yeah. So, well, if you think about it, it's just like a, a modern application, and you can do a lot of stuff. It's very interactive. It gives you a lot of feedback as, um, while you're using it. So if you're a relative developer and you have to rebuild something like this, how do you do it? How do you keep it maintainable? And how do you keep it simple at the same time? And the more I was working on Rails, the more I just realized, well, you can't. You can't. Um, some, some apps are just complex. And there is no way of keeping it simple whenever you're writing on something like that. Um, something funny I found is that on the Zen of Python, um, it says that simple is better than complex. But the sentence immediately after that is complex is better than complicated. And I guess I was lucky to find this framework which um, is really good for creating ambitious web applications. Um, and I think that like, this is the only framework which now makes me comfortable in rebuilding Gmail. And matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago, I was just like rebuilding in our own apps a little bit of things I've seen in Gmail and just worked. So um, I think like, the good thing about uh, real apps and ambitious apps is that they solve real problems and reality is full of complexity. Um, so I think that whenever you're thinking, well, I need a simple solution to a problem, sometimes the simple solution is not good enough. You need a more complicated solution. Um, actually, this is a real quote. I, I did my research. Um, the majority of the experts uh, agree that this is an Albert Einstein's quote. I couldn't come to a, like, um, like a real quote, but most of the people seem to agree that this is actually a true quote, which is everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. So I guess like the, thing, the main thing I learned when I was learning Ember is... Um, well, just like don't use simplicity as an excuse, or otherwise you're just gonna make like super simple apps, and nobody uses super simple apps. Um, something I found out at the same time when I was working um, in Ember is that I figured out what I didn't really like in JS land, and it wasn't really the syntax, even though I'm a Rubyist at heart, so. I like nice looking code. Um, it wasn't handling state. So building a stateful app, yeah, it's tricky at the beginning, but it's not like super hard. Um, it's not handling a sync. You just have to learn how promises work and it can take you a couple of days, but then you're good. I think the biggest problem for me when I was learning all the, those JavaScript frameworks is this sort of mindset which is this, um, what I call it, revolution at any cost. And I think another really good term is uh, high fatigue. There's an awesome talk by Godfrey, which is called um, An Antidote to the High Fatigue. And it's my favorite, one of my favorite talks about Ember. And the basic concept is that um, you hit um, a sort of, oh, whoa, 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 that was a lot. Um, so you see, you learn about a new technology, um, you think that this technology is going to solve everything. It's going to fix all your problems. And then after a while, after a couple of weeks, you actually use this technology. You realize, not really. Um, it has problems. It doesn't really solve like, my, prob like my, um, my actual use case perfectly. So you jump on another hype train. And you're like, oh, well, uh, that didn't work. But I'm sure that this will work. And you try out something else and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. And the JavaScript board means 15 different frameworks in six months, I think. Um, last year, I was at Baruco, um, and Mats, which is creator of Ruby, he talked about this syndrome, uh, which is called the second system syndrome. And I think that every web developer has suffered of this syndrome at least once. And you know you're a victim of the syndrome whenever you hear yourself saying, well, I think we need to rebuild this system from scratch. Um, it's going to make it easier to use, faster, more expressive. Yeah, we're just going to skimp a little bit on backwards compatibility. And it's not only us, but it's also huge open source projects. 
Pearl 5 to Pearl 6. I think it finally landed this year. After 10 years, something like that. Python 2 to Python 3. Um, I think there's uh, like 70% of the projects are still in Python 2 after a lot of years that Python 3 was released. And more recently, um, the transition between Angular 1 and Angular 2. So I think it's really, really common to think that um, you figure out everything and you just need to build a new solution which is gonna fix all the previous problems you've ever met. And I think that if we think in biological terms, we already know what this is about. And in biology, we call it intelligent design. And it's basically, I think, it's either you, if you're a human being or a superhuman being, what you're thinking is, I have the perfect plan, now I just need to build it. And then if we do that, we're good. Um, luckily, in the field of biology, we've come to an agreement uh, that there is something better. There's this theory, which is called the theory of evolution, which um, tells us that nature doesn't, doesn't really work in that way. It doesn't work through continuous revolutions. Um, something funny I found in the process of researching this is that this is the, a survey on a response to the statement, human beings as we know them develop from earlier species of animals. And there's a bunch of countries here and <laughs> something funny, uh, you can see it on the right. Um, my friends told me it's better to live it like this, so I will do that. Um, but it's 40%. Come on. Um, actually, uh, I found this quote, which was 100 years before Darwin wrote about the theory of evolution. And uh, it's by Linnaeus. It's a Swedish uh, natural historian, I think. And he wrote this um, sentence in Latin. Apparently, he used to write Latin all the time by then. And it says, nature does not make jumps. And in natural history, it's just, like in natural biology, it's just this idea that nature does not operate by big jumps. It operates by little steps. So step by step, millions of millions and millions of little steps, state nature evolves. And I think what's cool about Ember is actually we're just doing the same thing. We just call it with a different name. And something which I loved really was this quote by Wycats, is that eventually all the good ideas will end up in Ember. <laughs> and I think this is really great because it just tells you that... Um, there isn't a new revolution coming out tomorrow which is gonna change everything because little by little, step by step, small idea by small idea, everything good will end up in amber. So when I started learning amber two years ago, I was just learning another framework. I was like, okay, I'm just gonna pick up this new JavaScript library. I've like learned a lot of them. And I think what changed in these two years is that um, I think there's a lot of good pieces of software living around. So if you want to learn a good framework, there's so many of them, and um, you can pick them up, and it's just like a new tool. But I think that whenever you're learning something, um, like a JavaScript framework, you s tend to buy into a sort of religion. So <laughs> I think this is quite common. Um, I'm not sure uh, this code is accurate either. Um, but I think that what I really love about Ember now that I've learned it is that it's much more than a frame of working. It's a frame of mind. So there are some things which I really appreciate about Ember and, for example, is having a truly open source process. I don't think there's any other project out there which has something as cool as the RFCs. Um, there isn't another project which is so focused on backwards compatibility that every time there is a new version of Ember, the first thing that happens is that you know what you need to change first. Um, and I don't think I've ever met um, another community which is so inclusive. And I'm not just talking about uh, like the normal sense of inclusion. Um, I'm talking about, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you guys have um, heard of this, but uh, Ember CLI Deploy. And it was like five different projects at some point. And then all the different five maintainers um, just spoke 
And they said, oh, maybe we should just come up with one solution for deploying Ember. And if you see that, I think it's really, really hard to find another example of that in the current community. So um, what I want to end up with is um, I think what really makes me love Ember is this idea of continuous mutation over short-lived revolutions. And I don't think there's anything more important than that. So <laughs> the final thing I'll end up with is don't be a JS creationist, learn to love Ember. And that's it. <laughs>